My name is Allison Kepler. I'm Director of Education here at the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio. I'm so excited for you to join us today for our first legacy lecture that we are streaming on Facebook Live. So before we get started and I turn it over to our director, I wanted to just uh, review a few housekeeping issues. We're gonna be monitoring on Facebook if you have questions for our speaker today. Um, there's also a Q&A function here that we'll be checking out. And um, if you have questions or if there are resources that Rebecca is going to be sharing with us, we'll be sure to put those in the chat today. Um, so those are basic housekeeping. We are recording this and we are on Facebook Live. Um, so if you miss it, you can come back online and see it on social media. And um, this is our first time streaming. So please excuse our awkwardness, but by July 1st, next week on Wednesday, we will be sure to have it under control. And we have a really amazing talk. We have three exhibitions coming up and one relates to um, women who have run for president. And we will have a great talk on Wednesday, July 1st, same time, same place, uh, by Dr. Judith Dan. And the topic is Victoria Woodhall. And the title is really amazing. Um, it is Queen Victoria or Mrs. Satan, uh, Victoria Woodhall. So I think that's going to be a fascinating talk. Victoria Woodhall is an amazing character um, in history, and I hope you will join us to learn more about her. And then on July 23rd, our very own archivist curator, Michelle Gillian, will be giving a talk on First Ladies and Suffrage. So as we're celebrating the suffrage centennial this year, what role did First Ladies play in suffrage? Were they advocates? for suffrage. Um, we want to know more and um, there is no better source than Michelle to find that out. So those are our two upcoming talks. We also have a number of hands-on activities, book club discussions. So please keep checking our Facebook page for more information. So now I am going to turn things over to our director at First Ladies Library, Jennifer Highfield, who will be introducing our speaker. Thank you so much. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Allison, for the introduction. I'm Jenny Highfield. I'm the president and CEO of National First Ladies Library. This institution was started about 30 years ago um, by 13 civic-minded um, feminists um, who really felt that there was an obligation to um, bring to light the lack of research and um, and, um, and knowledge about the First Ladies of the United States. Um, Mary Regula started this organization um, and begun with the Ida McKinley, uh, Ida Saxon McKinley Home, which is on our site, um, and then also worked here in our research, education and research center. Dr. Fisher was one of those original 13 women, um, and Dr. Fisher was a local woman here who, um, who despite um, the time frame where she um, and, and Mrs. Regula both, um, you know, sort of grew up and became women, um, you know, went and had both were educated, had phenomenal careers. Dr. Fisher had a career as a psychologist. Um, she did phenomenal things here in Stark County for Stark County suicide. Um, prevention. She was a volunteer for a Women's Altman Board at the Camp Museum of Art, on and on and on, Mount Union and so forth. Um, but she had this um, sincere passion for history and a really um, particular passion for Victoria era um, history. And Mrs. Regula found out about that and they became quick friends. And from there, Dr. Fisher came on board to be the vice president in charge of restoration, renovation and acquisitions here for the site. So those two women created the site that now exists here in Star County in Canton, Ohio. Um, and it was a long um, and arduous process to restore two historic buildings on two city blocks and to provide the phenomenal experience that our visitors now get to have. Um, and from that, Dr. Fisher won an award, won several awards, but one of the um, I think the most important awards, at least for us, was the Ohio History Society acknowledged her um, Arger's work on the preservation of these buildings and gave her um, an outstanding achievement award for that. Dr. Fisher did say that women have a tremendous impact in our society and too often their value has gone unrecognized. 
if this is going to be the only institution dedicated to the history of our first ladies, it should be done perfectly. And she absolutely did that. I think today she's looking down very proudly on her granddaughter, Rebecca, who spent um, much of her youth here at this site um, and became our first official junior ranger um, and helped provide tours to our visitors and so forth. So I know that um, we're certainly proud to have Rebecca um, as one of our biggest advocates um, in all of her contributions accomplishments and her passion for women's history. So we're so proud to have Rebecca here with us today. Um, and with that, Rebecca, um, we can't wait to hear your talk. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Allison and everyone at the National First Ladies Library for having me today. And thank you all of you um, for tuning in on this Thursday. Um, as Jenny said, my name is Rebecca Rubin. I am a um, public historian. And I am going to be talking about the suffragist Lucy Stone today. So I'm just going to one second, sorry, just pull up my PowerPoint. Jenny, would you mind just speaking for a few seconds while I figure this out? No worries. Here, there I am. Um, yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who don't know, because I can see we have people who, oh, there we are. Good. See, you just needed me to. <laughs> Thank there you. We go. You're welcome. All right. So as I said, I am going to be speaking about Lucy Stone. But first, I'm going to start off by talking about two suffragists uh, who are not Lucy Stone. And those two women are Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So you can see on the screen here just a few of the museums and uh, historic markers dedicated to these two uh, suffragists. There's a Susan B. Anthony Museum in Rochester, New York, um, another Susan B. Anthony Museum in Adams, Massachusetts, and then the Women's Rights National Historic, Historical Park, uh, which is in Seneca Falls, New York. And the reason why the park is in Seneca Falls is because of um, the first uh, Women's Rights Convention, which was held in Seneca Falls. So when we think about suffrage history, we often think of Seneca Falls, we think about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and they loom large in the popular imagination. These are the women that are taught in school when we learn about suffrage history. But there is so much more about the early history of women's suffrage than, than these two women and Seneca Falls. So for example, even though Susan B. Anthony arguably has um, two to three museums dedicated to her, Lucy Stone doesn't have any museums dedicated to her. But Lucy Stone contributed just as much to the cause of women's suffrage as these two women, and I would argue should be remembered alongside these other leaders of the suffrage movement. Lucy Stone was born in West Brookfield, Massachusetts, um, and you can see the foundation of her birthplace here. Um, unfortunately, this home burned down in 1950, but you can see on the screen as well the um, marker that a local historical society put um, in this place. Um, so you can see West Brookfield, Massachusetts here on the map. Uh, it's in central Massachusetts, about 20 miles away from Worcester. Lucy Stone was born in 1818. She had three brothers and three sisters, and her father had a temper and he was prone to drinking. And this was really important um, because it helped uh, Lucy come to terms with her ideas about divorce um, later on in life and whether women should have the right to divorce their husbands. 
Her mother was very religious um, and she warned young Lucy about the evils of things like dancing, reading novels, and going to the theater. Both of the Stone uh, parents were passionate about education for their children, but only up to a certain point um, for their daughters, as we will learn about. Uh, you can see young Lucy there. And Lucy wrote often to her older brothers while they were away at college. In one of her letters um, in 1840, when she was 22 years old, she wrote to her brother Beau, quote, only let females be educated in the same manner and with the same advantages that males have. And as everything in nature seeks its own level, I would risk that we would find out our appropriate sphere. So here she's talking about the societal norm um, for women, particularly white women who were born in the United States, uh, to stay in the home or the domestic sphere and to not venture into, the pu into public affairs or the public sphere. But Lucy was already um, very passionate about education. Both of the Stone parents were abolitionists. And Lucy subscribed to the views of the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison was one of the founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society. And he believed in the immediate emancipation of enslaved people instead of a more gradual emancipation, which um, more conservative abolitionists were proponents of. And Lucy was very passionate about abolitionism as well, to the point that when her brother Frank uh, wrote her to say that he was getting married, this was Lucy's reply. Quote, I had an impression that she was not an abolitionist, but I think it must be erroneous, for I don't believe you would marry a wife who was not anti-slavery. Um, so very, very passionate about her beliefs and not afraid of telling um, her siblings about it. Lucy also kept an engraving of the gentleman here, William Lloyd Garrison, in her bedroom later in life. Uh, Lucy was inspired by a number of uh, women abolitionists. Two of those were Sarah and Angelina Grimke. These were sisters uh, from South Carolina. Their parents um, owned uh, enslaved people. And these two sisters began lecturing against slavery in the 1830s. And they were some of the first women to participate publicly in a social reform movement. Lucy was also inspired by Abby Kelly Foster, um, another abolitionist who was also from Massachusetts like Lucy. The entire Stone family went to see Abby Kelly Foster speak. And um, Lucy was very impressed by the abolitionist speech, but reportedly Lucy's father was not impressed. After uh, spe spending some time at different schools um, throughout central and western Massachusetts, including Mount Holyoke Female Seminary um, in South Hadley, Massachusetts, Lucy decided to travel to Oberlin, Ohio, you can see on the map there um, near Cleveland, to attend the Oberlin Collegiate Institute, which was the first college in the country to admit both men and women of all races. She was one of seven women who enrolled that year, along with 34 men. And in order to pay for her education, she borrowed money from her father um, because she had asked uh, for, that, for, her, for her parents um, to pay for her education and they refused, even though they paid uh, for the tuition for Lucy's older brothers to attend college. And she also continued um, teaching uh, younger children and she used um, that money to help pay for her uh, tuition as well. It was at Oberlin that Lucy met Antoinette Brown Blackwell, um, or as Lucy called her, Nettie. When Nettie first met Lucy, Nettie thought that Lucy was 18 years old instead of Lucy's 27. And Nettie said, 
quote, I promptly decided that she talked altogether too much and with an unfitting absoluteness of conviction and of authority for any young girl. Lucy and Nettie became great friends. Their friendship continued throughout their lives. Um, and they were unafraid to disagree with each other. Um, they talked about their aspirations. So Lucy um, wanted to uh, have some kind of career speaking publicly in favor, in favor of abolitionism. Um, and Nettie wanted to be, be ordained as a minister and there had not been a woman ordained as a minister in the United States um, yet at that time. But in addition to talking about uh, various serious aspirations, they also talked about whether or not they should wear artificial flowers on their bonnets. Um, so you can see here, this is a, a letter that Lucy wrote to her mother, Hannah, while Lucy was at Oberlin. Um, so she's talking here about um, trying to convince the faculty of Oberlin um, to let the women in her class read essays that they had written for graduation. Um, Lucy says, quote, they have never been allowed to do it, but we expect to read for ourselves or not to write. So unfortunately, um, there, because women were not um, supposed, white women were not supposed to speak publicly, Lucy and Nettie formed a small women's debating society um, and they had to practice in secret. Um, so they, they had prepared to read their essays aloud at um, their graduation ceremony, but unfortunately the faculty did not allow women to read their essays, so Lucy and her classmates did not write their essays. Lucy graduated uh, from Oberlin in 1847 when she was 29 years old. And after graduating, she returned to West Brookfield, Massachusetts, uh, to teach so she could repay the loans her father lent her. Um, she was hoping that her father would forgive the loans, but he insisted that she pay him back. Uh, while she was back in Massachusetts, uh, she gave her first public talk on women's rights. Her brother was a minister, and it was from his pulpit that she gave this talk in Gardner, Massachusetts. Lucy then joined um, one of her heroes, Abby Kelly Foster, as an agent for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Association, and she was hired with a salary of $6 a week. When uh, Lucy told Nettie that she was going to start working for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, this was Nettie's response. Quote, so Elle, you are going to lecturing, are you? Well, you had better have told us so and not said perhaps. Success to the truth and to you, dearest Lucy, so far as you preach it and preach it in the right spirit. I am glad you are going to lecture. Be good, Lucy, be good, and don't be afraid of anybody, but speak as though you had a right to. And here is an image of Lucy um, from a few years after this. So Lucy thought that um, in the 18, early 1850s was a particularly important time to be doing abolitionist work. The Fugitive Slave Act um, had just passed which meant that enslaved people were required to be returned to enslavers even if the enslaved people were found in a free state. So Lucy said, quote, there has never been a time when anti-slavery effort could be more immediately effective than now. And you can see um, a flyer for the Massachusetts uh, anti-slavery society and also a um, collection box where you could put your um, coins uh, to donate to the Massachusetts anti-slavery society and it has um, the popular image of the kneeling enslaved man which is often associated with the, the phrase am I not a man and a brother. 
Lucy began to um, talk about women's rights while she was lecturing for the Anti-Slavery Association. Um, but when they found out about this, they admonished her and she um, came, to a, came to a compromise with them where she would only lecture for them on the weekends, but she could speak about women's rights during the week. But of course, they weren't going to pay her for that. So as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we tend to remember the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention held in Seneca Falls, New York um, in 1848 when we think about um, women's suffrage. So this was happening all around the same time. At the Seneca Falls Convention, about uh, 300 people from just the local region, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, came together excuse me, to write the Declaration of Sentiments, which was their response to the Declaration of Independence. But it's important to note that this was not a suffrage convention. And indeed, um, Frederick Douglass, who you see on the right, um, who was a, an abolitionist who had formerly been enslaved, had to convince the women attending this convention to include women's suffrage in their document. Um, otherwise, they weren't going to include it. Susan B. Anthony did not attend this convention, um, even though she lived in Rochester, New York, which was not very far away. Um, and she also didn't did not attend two weeks later when Rochester held their own convention modeled after the Seneca Falls Convention. It wasn't until Susan B. Anthony befriended Elizabeth Cady Stanton in the 1850s um, that Anthony became involved in the women's rights movement. In 1850, the first statewide suffrage convention was held um, in Salem, Ohio, which is in uh, Northeastern Ohio. But Lucy organized the first National Women's Rights Convention, and that was held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850. Lucy soon became one of the most recognized names in America. Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, said that no one in the abolitionist movement, quote, arrested more attention than did Lucy Stone. Accounts say that her voice was like a silver flute, and the New York Times said, quote, Miss Stone is an agreeable orator with an agreeable manner, an agreeable person, and a disagreeable subject. By the early 1850s, Lucy was, was earning hundreds of dollars a year just from lecturing, and that was a considerable income for a woman at the time. But she also faced much opposition. Um, she was sprayed with cold water in the middle of winter. She was pelted with rotten eggs. And on one occasion, she was mobbed on stage and she calmly turned to um, one of the attackers and asked him to escort her outside, which he did. And then she continued lecturing um, while standing on a tree stump. All of this took a toll on her health, as you might imagine. Um, so it was around this time that Lucy started wearing bloomer suits, and you can see her, um, an engraving of Lucy in one of her bloomer suits. Um, she, uh, so we associate the bloomer suits with Amelia Bloomer, who was a suffragist um, who lived in Seneca Falls, but we do know that Lucy made her first bloomer outfit in the summer of 1849, which was a year before Amelia Bloomer even donned the garment. But Lucy was a big proponent of um, the bloomer suit. And she wrote to Nettie, quote, do take care of your health, Nettie. And to that end, I wish you would wear a bloomer. I had constant and hard meetings, but I bore it well from the freedom and comfort of my dress. It is a great deal the best for health. Um, the bloomer suit did not catch on. Um, and Susan B. Anthony said, quote, if Lucy Stone, with all her reputation, her powers of eloquence, her loveliness of character, that wins all who once hears the sound of her voice, cannot bear the martyrdom of the dress, who, I ask, can? And Lucy recalled later on, quote, I knew so little of the world 
that I thought the example of a dress so suited to the needs of life would at once be adopted. Um, the bloomer suit even put off Lucy's suitor, Henry Blackwell. He admitted he was not typically a fan of the bloomer suit, but he was willing to overlook it for Lucy's sake. Um, so there's Henry Blackwell. He was uh, from Cincinnati, uh, seven years younger than Lucy, but he was already dedicated to the causes of abolitionism and women's rights. And in fact, um, Henry's older sister, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, became the first woman to graduate from medical school in the United States. So he had some very impressive sisters. Henry was uh, very interested in Lucy, and he attended the fourth annual Women's Rights Convention, which was held in Cleveland in 1853. He gave a speech um, to impress her, and his speech lasted over an hour. A local paper said later that he, quote, forgot it was a woman's convention. Uh, but Henry believed in a truly companionate marriage, and he told Lucy, quote, I wish I could could take the position of a wife under the law and give you that of a husband. But Lucy uh, wasn't sure about marrying Henry. Not only did he um, kind of waver in his career, she also had written letters to Nettie saying that she was opposed to marriage and that she wasn't going to marry. And we have the response, um, Nettie's response to her uh, to one of those letter passages in her letters. So Nettie says here, quote, do not fear my getting married. I am glad to respond most heartily to your emphatic don't, 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 and send it back like an echo to yourself. But when Henry helped um, an enslaved girl um, in Salem, Ohio, who was fleeing sl slavery, it seemed to be a turning point for Lucy and um, she began to reciprocate Henry's interest in her. So in Philadelphia at the next year's annual Women's Rights Convention, Lucy wrote to Henry, quote, while the minutes are being read, my thoughts run away to you and to our future. So if she's being distracted during a women's rights convention, you know that um, she has pretty strong feelings for him. So they um, decide to get married. And Lucy writes to Nettie um, in 1855 about the marriage. Um, quote, if the, seminar, if the ceremony is held in New York, we want to harden your heart enough to help in so cruel an operation as putting Lucy Stone to death but it will all be according to law, so you need feel no punishment. So um, Lucy uh, was cognizant of her objections uh, to marriage, and Lucy and Henry ended up um, writing a marriage protest statement. Um, you can see a draft of it here. And um, so this statement basically um, is protesting the legal and social inequality inequalities of traditional marriage. And um, a line from it says, quote, thus reverencing law, we enter our protest against rules and customs which are unworthy of the name since they violate justice, the essence of law. The marriage was um, covered in the newspapers. So the New York Times um, said, quote, Miss Lucy Stone has succumbed at last. In spite of all her diatribes against the tyranny of marriage and her assertion of woman's rights, she has come under the yoke and is now the lawfully wedded wife of Mr. Henry B. Blackwell. There is a great deal of human nature in Miss Lucy after all. Immediately after they were married, uh, Lucy began going as Lucy Stone Blackwell, but she then reverted back to Lucy Stone, making her one of the first women in the United States, if not the first, to insist on going on uh, by her birth name after marriage. Uh, soon after this, uh, Nettie, who also um, was stridently against marriage, ended up marrying Henry's brother, Sam. So Lucy and Nettie um, became sisters-in-law.
Lucy continued to lecture throughout the country until she gave birth to her daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, in 1857. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Lucy came from a large family, so she hoped to have four children. And in her uh, typical, um, very rational manner, she wrote to Nettie saying that she would like to have two sets of twins, kind of just to get it, get it all out of the way um, efficiently. But Lucy ended up um, just having her one daughter, daughter, Alice, and she became very protective over her daughter. She decided to wait until Alice was five years old before she resumed lecturing, but she also wanted to um, remain involved in the fight for women's suffrage at this time. So a mere two months after she gave birth, Lucy decided not to pay um, some property taxes in protest of her inability to vote. And as a result, the town constable seized uh, two tables, four chairs, and her engraved portrait of William Lloyd Garrison. And these were sold at public auction, uh, but fortunately a neighbor bought them back um, and returned them to uh, Lucy. Around this time, the Civil War began um, in 1861, and Lucy turned her attention to abolitionism. In 1863, Lucy, Nettie, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as others, formed the Women's Loyal National League. So this was after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which declared all enslaved people in Confederate states as free. But the Women's Loyal National League wanted to collect one million signatures to submit to Congress, demanding an immediate end to slavery. They ended up collecting 400,000, which was still an admirable amount, and this helped convince Congress to pass the 13th Amendment in January 1865 that ended slavery. The war ended um, in April of 1865. As the 13th Amendment went out to the states for ratification, Congress began debating a 14th Amendment to the Constitution that would give Black men full citizenship and suffrage and limit the congressional represent representation of any state that prevented Black men from voting. So Susan B. Anthony thought that it would be a step backward to give Black men the vote before giving it to white women. And she also thought that expanding the number of male voters would create more barriers for women's enfranchisement. Another concern was that the 14th Amendment would be the first time that the word male uh, was added to the Constitution, which made it gender specific. Um, in May of 1866, suffragists and abolitionists, including Lucy and Susan B. Anthony, formed the American Equal Rights Association to demand the vote for both white women and black men and women. So it was um, after the war that men kind of emerged with this heightened sense of masculinity, the idea that they had paid the full price of war by fighting, and congressmen tied the right of suffrage to the war, claiming that only those who could fight deserved the right to vote, even though many American men didn't serve in the Civil War. But the following month, Congress passed the 14th Amendment. So around this time, um, Henry wrote a letter addressed to Southern legislatures telling them to give only white women the vote. Um, this is obviously problematic, uh, but we have no written record of what Lucy thought of this at the time. We do know that soon after, um, she, Lucy hoped that Black men once they had the vote, would help white women and black women get the vote. So uh, Henry and Lucy traveled to Kansas, um, to, sponsored by the American Equal Rights Association in 1876 to convince voters there to remove white and male from their state constitution. And uh, Colonel Sam N. Wood, who was the state senator in Kansas and a champion of women's suffrage, said, quote, with the help of God and Lucy Stone, we shall carry Kansas. 
Stanton and Anthony followed Lucy and Henry to Kansas, but without consulting the members of the American Equal Rights Association, they accepted money from this man, uh, George Francis Train. Uh, Train opposed the Civil War and was against the Black vote, and Lucy was very angry that they had taken money from him. They, so ultimately, um, they were defeated in Kansas, but it didn't mean very much because Congress soon passed the 15th Amendment, which prevented suffrage from being denied to anyone, but that means men, on account of race. Lucy um, was a supporter of the, the 15th Amendment, but Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were not. In 1868, Stanton and Anthony decided to leave the American, the American Equal Rights Association and start their own suffrage association. And they called this the National Woman Suffrage Association or the NWSA. They only invited uh, select people to join and they did not invite Henry or Lucy. Stanton also um, and Anthony also accepted more money from George Francis Train to establish their own newspaper, The Revolution. In the next year, in 1869, Lucy, um, Henry, and others formed the American Woman's Suffrage Association, or the AWSA. Lucy had hoped to discuss the formation of this uh, new association with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and she wrote Stanton a letter um, hoping that Stanton would reply. But Stanton's only re reply was sending a clipping of an article that she had written for the NWSA newspaper, The Revolution. And this article um, called the founders of the AWSA, quote, a few dissatisfied minds and Boston malcontents who had been working to undermine the NWSA officers. So there were some key differences between these two organizations. The NWSA, formed by Stanton and Anthony, uh, did not allow men as members. They wanted a federal suffrage amendment in the Constitution, um, and they advocated for other issues along with women's suffrage, such as divorce and free love. And this particularly um, advocating for free love was very radical. Lucy um, supported other women's rights uh, causes, but she thought that supporting these other causes would distract from gaining women's suffrage. And she thought that once women had the vote, they would be able to advocate for these other causes better. The AWSA, which was formed um, by Lucy and others, allowed men as members and they could hold office within the organization. They also focused on getting suffrage at the local and state level instead of a federal amendment. Another difference was that um, Black suffragists tended to join the AWSA, and this makes sense because of Stanton and Anthony's um, views on Black men getting the vote. So we have Black suffragists like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who was a writer, a poet, and a lecturer, and she was a founding member of AWSA. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was a leader in the Black Women's Club movement, and she was also a member of AWSA. And she spoke about the warm welcome that Lucy and other white suffragists um, uh, extended out to her when she joined the AWSA. And we also have people like Lottie Rowan, who we unfortunately don't have an image of, but she and her sisters were all prominent uh, black suffragists and she was an AWSA member. In addition to leading the AWSA, Lucy and Henry started a newspaper called The Woman's Journal. Lucy basically did everything. She wrote articles, she recruited editors, she served as editor, um, she, got subscribers. And as you can see here, the masthead says that it is a weekly newspaper uh, devoted to the interests of women, to their educational, industrial, legal, and political equality, and especially to their right of suffrage.
writers such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Louisa May Alcott, author of Little Women, um, both contributed to the Woman's Journal. And Cherry Chapman, Chapman Catt, who was the key suffragist um, later in the movement, said that the suffrage movement was, quote, not conceivable without the Woman's Journal in it. But this was exhausting for Lucy. And she wrote, quote, I wish I could rest. I am so tired today, body and soul. It seems as though I should never feel free again. And for years, um, they didn't collect a salary from publishing the Woman's Journal. Henry sometimes had to pay the bills, at, the Woman's Journal's bills out of his own pocket. But at their peak, they had 6,000 subscribers. Uh, Lucy continued to attend every AWSA meeting, traveling to Minneapolis, Topeka, Detroit, Omaha, Louisville, and Cleveland, until she couldn't travel because of poor health. She also um, called her daughter Alice the daughter of the regiment and prepared Alice for her role in the suffrage movement. And this rivalry between Lucy and Susan B. Anthony Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton continued. Anthony actually attended the 1870 AWSA meeting, and at that meeting, she accused Lucy of splitting the suffrage movement, even though Anthony and Stanton formed the NWSA first. But fighting for women's suffrage became something like a religion to Lucy. She said in 1869, quote, it is because I have this quiet faith in the certain triumph of the right that I am entirely undisturbed by anything which venom and ill nature can do. It was around this time that you can see Lucy um, was kind of getting worried that she wasn't going to live to be able to vote um, and that all of her life's work um, wasn't going to pay off. So she does start to say um, some things that kind of undermine her previous um, ideals of equality for everyone. So she, we know that she said something about um, immigrants uh, to the United States not caring about whether they have the right to vote and that it's a good thing that there were more white women in Boston than Irish immigrants because the white woman would be able to outvote um, the Irish immigrants. So Lucy was was not perfect, um, as we can tell, neither was Henry. Um, so, and it's important to realize that um, many of these white women suffragists were very complicated figures and a lot of them um, kind of did, took, I don't, just like, didn't always uh, say things that were in the spirit of their um, views about equality. So Lucy had a chance uh, to vote in a school district election in Massachusetts. She paid the $2 poll tax, but the registrar in Boston wouldn't let her vote using her name, Lucy Stone, because it wasn't her husband's name. And unfortunately, this was the only um, opportunity for her to vote in her lifetime, so she never got to vote. She began to have some health problems, um, including rheumatism, bouts of pneumonia and bronchitis. And it was around this time that Stanton and Anthony requested Lucy's cooperation in their efforts to compile the history of women's suffrage. And Lucy refused, saying that she had, quote, ceaseless regret that any one wing of suffragists should attempt to write the history of the other. So Stanton and Anthony basically wrote Lucy out of their book. The Woman's Journal printed a negative review of the first volume, and Lucy herself wrote her own attack of the second volume. In it, she said, quote, no one reading this book would get an accurate or adequate idea of the real history of the women's suffrage movement. But uh, Stan Stanton and Anthony and Lucy both tried to reconcile with each other at different points in time, um, and they took turns uh, rejecting these attempts. But by 1887, Lucy was ready to reconcile. In 1888, a meeting uh, sponsored by the NWSA um, celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention. 
Henry didn't think it made sense uh, to have, make such a big um, fuss about this anniversary because the Seneca Falls Convention, quote, really was not a very special landmark in the women's movement. And you can see um, this picture. Uh, Henry is seated in the middle and Lucy is standing behind him. Um, and their daughter Alice is uh, just peeking over to the left um, of Lucy. And they're with, with some family friends here. So Lucy um, wrote to Nettie. They decided that they would attend this anniversary um, meeting. And Lucy said, quote, I think we ought to puncture the bubble that the Seneca Falls meeting was the first public demand for suffrage. So when uh, at the meeting, Nettie made a speech uh, claiming that the Oberlin Debating Society that she and Lucy founded was the first organized women's club. And then Lucy emphasized that the speech that the woman's rights speech she gave um, at her brother's church was one year before the Seneca Falls Convention. Alice also attended um, this uh, week of events and she described Susan B. Anthony as, quote, tall, sharp, dictatorial, conceited, pugnacious, and selfish. And she also said, quote, it is rather irritating to see unworthy women who hate your mother and have constantly maligned her receiving a week's continuous ovation. But um, in February 1890 in Washington, DC, um, the leaders of the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association decided to join forces and they formed the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, Lucy hoped to attend this meeting um, where they formed the new organization, but she was ill, so she couldn't. Um, so when uh, she heard about what happened, she heard that Elizabeth Cady Stanton was voted president, Susan B. Anthony was voted vice president, and Lucy was appointed to the chair of, a, of the executive committee. But Lucy had hoped that leaders of um, both of the previous organizations would step down and let other women um, take the leadership roles in this new organization, but that did not happen. And it's uh, notable that Black uh, suffragists were skeptical of this new organization because there was no change in leadership. Um, later on, the new organization refused to pass a resolution condemning Jim Crow. And uh, there was a consistent trend of racist argumentation at these conventions in order to support women's suffrage. Lucy uh, was invited to speak at the Chicago's Columbian Exposition in 1893, which we often refer to as the Chicago's World Fair. Um, and this was the last speech that she would ever give. Her health declined after she returned from Chicago. And Lucy died on October 18th, 1893. Um, 1,100 people attended her funeral, and her death was widely covered in newspapers. The Washington Post called her the first woman suffragist. And you can see on the screen here the special memorial edition of the woman's journal after Lucy's death. Uh, Alice, uh, her daughter, continued printing the Woman's Journal until the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. And Nettie, Lucy's friend, was still alive in 1920 once women, um, white women, received the right to vote. But she was in poor health, uh, so she didn't get to vote either, unfortunately. But even after the 19th Amendment was passed, many women who fought for suffrage still could not vote. And it's important to remember this in this centennial year of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. It's important to remember who actually received the right to vote when the 19th Amendment was passed. So the 19th Amendment rested on a bargain with the southern states that the 15th Amendment would not be enforced. So that was the amendment that said that if states tried to prevent black men from voting that they um, would, their congressional representation would be docked for that. So because the 15th Amendment would not be enforced, black disenfranchisement 
could remain. And Black Americans still face uh, widespread disenfranchisement today. Native American women who um, fought for the vote will, were still unable to vote until 1924 because they weren't deemed citizen, American citizens until 1924, but most were effectively barred from voting until 1948. And Asian American women, who were many of whom were also involved in the suffrage movement, um, were, didn't receive the vote until the 1950s. But Lucy Stone's legacy lives on. It lives on in women who choose to keep their birth names, who are sometimes called Lucy Stoners. It lives on whenever women go to exercise the right to vote. And it lives on whenever we fight for equality. And as Lucy Stone said in her last public speech at the Columbian Exposition, Quote, now all we need is to continue to speak the truth fearlessly, and we shall add to our number those who will turn the scale to the side of equal and full justice in all things. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. We have a few questions um, from the audience on Facebook. Um, and I have one or two for you, if that is okay. Um, at the beginning of your talk, someone was asking about, um, was there any response from the women who worked as nurses in the Civil War to the logic that only men should receive a uh, right to vote because they fought? No. Um, that's a good, good question. I know that um, for example, Clara Barton, who was a nurse in the Civil War, was an ardent suffragist. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, I don't, I don't have an exact um, letter or um, primary source saying that she disagreed that with this off, off the top of my head. But I'm sure that she would have agreed, uh, disagreed with that logic um, because, of course, women um, did work as nurses um, in the Civil War. And I'm sure that that probably solidified Clara Barton's ideas um, that women should have equal uh, suffrage rights as men. So another question just coming in here. Oh, there are so many. Um, someone mentioned her hairstyle, that she looked like she had maybe a short bobbed hair or, um, or a shorter hair look um, that was more traditionally Victorian and later years was the short hair as controversial at the time as bloomers would have been? Um, yes, I believe so, yes. Any, any kind of um, what we refer to as dress reform, um, any kind of change in uh, personal appearance that isn't kind of the typical um, Victorian or 19th century women's attire uh, would have been very controversial. Um, there are a lot of comments coming in here. Uh, Carol Levin says that she thought that possibly um, Nettie sh did vote um, in as a 95-year-old grandmother. So she has a newspaper quote uh, stating that. So that's kind of interesting. Um, another question we had for you um, thinking about the centennial and thinking about all of the change and protest that is going on in the world now, um, especially bringing voices who may have not been heard to the surface, who are the figures that you're looking at from the suffrage era that still need to be researched? Who um, is the next kind of Lucy Stone figure that uh, you're planning to maybe dig into or you advise other historians to? Definitely. There, there are so many women. And I think the centennial is giving um, historians and others a really good opportunity to dig into the history of these other suffragists. So um, someone, I think, uh, a suffragist that's really important is Mary Church Terrell. She was a Black suffragist, and she was one of the only Black suffragists who picketed the White House um, in the 1910s alongside uh, suffragist Al Alice Paul, because it wasn't um, uh, Black, Black suffragists were concerned about Black women protesting outside of the White House. They were concerned about violence um, and other uh, 
not kind of retaining this idea that of respectability that many uh, black women in the late 19th century ha had worked so hard um, to kind of cultivate. Um, Mary Church Terrell was extremely um, uh, concerned with respectability, but she also wasn't afraid about uh, what would happen when she protested. And she actually brought her uh, daughter with her to the protests outside the White House. And I think it's also important to remember that those suffragists um, who were protesting outside the White House were one of the first uh, protests outside of the White House. And we've kind of become uh, used to this image of, of people protesting there, but it was uh, the suffragists who did that first. So certainly Mary Church Terrell, um, Anna Julia Cooper, another um, Black suffragist who uh, received her PhD from the Sorbonne. Um, she was very interested in philosophy and um, fighting for women's suffrage that way. But th there, unfortunately, because of kind of the um, gaps in the historical record, there are so many of these suffragists who we may just never know about. Um, but there are quite a few of them who just don't get the attention that they deserve. And Mary Church Terrell was just um, recognized by Oberlin as well. I think the yes. library there was just renamed after her. So I also wanted to ask you, since we are both Oberlin alum, um, as I am learning about Lucy Stone and some of these figures, I'm really shocked about the way that women and suffragists were treated during that time period by the college because it seems to be considered such a liberal space. Um, I wanted to know if you knew any more about the suffrage history related to the, the town of Oberlin and the college. Sure. So I th Oberlin is, um, Oberlin's history is very interesting because it was um, originally a very Christian school. There was a theological seminary there. Um, so a lot of the um, abolitionists there were radical, but their radicalism was based in a certain kind of Christianity. So because of that, um, they have, there's this idea um, that Professor Carol Lasser has written about of radical respectability, which I think we see in a lot of the um, suffragists who come out of Oberlin, including Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone, um, was uh, seen as a very respectable woman. Um, so I think she kind of uh, took what she learned from Oberlin on board. Um, and there's this idea that if you look respectable, then maybe people will hear you and listen to you, um, which isn't, <laughs> it, it isn't always correct. And it's hard for suffragists because you are either too manly if you wear bloomers or you're too feminine if you wear typical frilly dresses and there isn't really kind of a, a middle ground there um but i have done um research uh on suffrage history at oberlin and there really aren't as many suffragists who attended oberlin as you would think that there would be it kind of has become this um very liberal place recently, um, but even in the 1920s, um, there was uh, racial segregation in the dorms and in the cafeterias. Uh, Mary Church Terrell, who was an Oberlin alum, sent her daughter to uh, attend Oberlin, but when she found out that there was all of this segregation going on, she had to pull um, ended up pulling her daughter out of school because it, it wasn't the Oberlin that she had been familiar with a generation prior. Um, so there are these waves of liberalism kind of tempered with conservatism and then in the 1920s, uh, kind of like a more ardent uh, conservatism. Thank you. Okay, I have a lot of comments coming in. There's a lot of information in the chat, people sharing books and other information. Um, a lot of people are very curious about Nettie and um, what what happened to her after she and Lucy crossed paths. What was her um, the rest of her life life like? Sure. So she um so she did become ordained as the first, according to many accounts, um, female uh, minister in the United States. She um, had a hard time finding someone that who 
who would ordain her because it was very controversial to have a female minister. Um, she spent a couple years, I think, at, um, as the minister of a church, I think, in upstate New York. Um, but then she decided that that just wasn't for her. So she uh, just, she did a bunch of things. She continued to support women's suffrage throughout her life. She actually um, wrote a number of books, some of them pertaining to science and um, certain uh, scientific ideologies that were uh, floating around at the time. And I actually uh, have written an article for Smithsonian Magazine about Nettie and I can, um, I guess I can, I can post it in the chat, but um, Nettie was the first woman to question some of Charles Darwin's um, sexist arguments in favor of um, evolution. So of course, she, she didn't argue with the idea of evolution, but Darwin, if you read Darwin's work, he uses a number of kind of um, sexist arguments in order to back up his theory. So she uh, wrote a book um, kind of pointing, pointing out that, that these ideas are sexist, and even if the theory is accurate, we should find other um, examples that aren't sexist in order to back the theory up. Great. There is another uh, question here from Carol Levin. Was there a deal with the 19th Amendment stating that the 15th Amendment wouldn't be enforced? Um, she says, I thought Jim Crow unenforced unenforcement started long before 1920. Um, yeah, so Jim Crow was uh, happening earlier than 1920. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I think it was in the late 1890s that the National American Woman Suffrage Association did uh, refuse to pass um, a resolution condemning Jim Crow, but I think that part of the kind of behind the scenes um, deal making that went on in order to get the 19th Amendment to pass was this kind of secretive, under the table, um, you don't have to enforce the 15th Amendment if you pass the 19th Amendment. So not, it, it wasn't an outright um, statement and Jim Crow had been happening for decades um, before that. So it looks like we are just about out of time. There's a lot of conversation and questions and sharing in the chat. So what we will do um, is thank Rebecca for joining us. This has been really fabulous and a great way to um, continue the conversation about uh, suffrage and women's history in Ohio. So I am really loving this. Um, we are going to be sharing this talk on our YouTube page. So if you didn't get to catch the whole thing or you want to come back and see it again, um, check out our YouTube. We'll share it on social media and we will try to share some more of the comments and discussion. People are sharing a lot of books. So thank you so much for joining us again um, on July 1st we'll have a talk by Dr. Judith Sam about Victoria Woodhall so please stay tuned for that and thank you so much Rebecca, for joining us and have a great afternoon thank you so much